Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I should add, I was, I was fortunate to be a part of that hostile environment training, and it was ironic because we're out in the beautiful Northern Irish countryside, and this property was used for two things, hostile environment training and weddings. So, <laughs> I have the privilege of speaking on behalf of the hundreds of journalists supported by the Pulitzer Center over the past decade, so I'm going to try and make this count. Uh, we are a very motley crew of freelancers and staffers, wordsmiths, shooters, and one-man bands. But at some level, we all identify with the Pulitzer Center's founding mission to tell underreported stories from far-flung parts of a world in flux. In many ways, my career as a journalist has followed the trajectory of the Pulitzer Center. When I started, news budgets were in free fall, and the very future of foreign news coverage was in doubt. Nostalgia was high, cynicism higher still. I was told no more than yes by many of the so-called gatekeepers, including the Pulitzer Center. <laughs> in fact, I was rejected not once, but twice when I applied for international reporting grants. But I also knew in my gut that I really wanted to do this kind of work. I believed in its purpose, and so I kept coming back. It's worth remembering that the Pulitzer Center also faced stiff resistance in the early days. And that's hard to believe from this stage, looking at all of you now, but many prominent news organizations and foundations were still too self-absorbed to see the value or necessity of nonprofit partnership. Now, of course, that's all taken for granted. We all evolved because we really had to. When I finally landed my first reporting grant, part of the deal was that I produce TV reports on insurgencies in India. At the time, I was a technophobic print reporter with no video experience or training. Naturally, I said I could do it, no problem. <laughs> One of the videos I produced was, was honestly unwatchable. Uh, <laughs> The other turned out okay. My confidence grew. I started to style myself as a multimedia journalist. And this is long before it became what is now a J school standard. I moved to Afghanistan, a video string that was facilitated, facilitated by the Pulitzer Center for Time.com, opened a back door to the magazine when the correspondent rotated out. When the news cycle slowed down, I produced documentaries and wrote long form articles. Doing a bit of everything has served me really well over the years, and I owe the Pulitzer Center for that. At a critical phase in my development, the combination of incentives, guidance, and contacts they provided stretched my limits, and I've been able to count on their support ever since. Over the past eight years, a dozen grants have enabled me to report on garment factories in Bangladesh, palm oil plantations in Borneo, a hidden resource war in northern Burma, and the fallout from civilian casualties in Afghanistan. I received hostile environment training and was insured on assignment, all on the Pulitzer Center's dime. Along the way, I've had the freedom to explore stories largely unburdened by editorial meddling and rigid deadlines. When Steve Sapienza, where's Steve? There he is, by the camera. Uh, when we were sent to investigate abusive labor practices in Thailand's uh, export shrimp industry, we had open-ended weeks to do so. This allowed us to connect dubious factories at the bottom of the supply chain with major U.S. buyers. Some of them responded by canceling their contracts. Our reporting had impact, in other words, thanks to the added time and resources that let us go deep. Other stories I've done simply would not have been possible. In 2014, I spent a month tracking an outbreak of polio in and around Syria. It was an ambitious and costly project and never would have happened were it not for a fast-track Pulitzer grant that the news outlet agreed to match. Several months ago, a story commission on Boko Haram violence in Nigeria was a non-starter until a grant came through. Of course, financial support is just the beginning. Once the reporting is done, we the journalists are often invited to share our work in classrooms, which is a highlight for me. Reporting, as many of you know, can be very lonely work, and beyond the comment section at the bottom of a story or a kudos from a college roommate, we seldom get a sense of how they received. 
But the conversations I've had with students at highbrow universities and inner city middle schools remind me that there's a vast audience out there that wants to engage with the issues that we care about. Some are even brazen enough to pursue journalism after college like I did. Real talk. The hard truth is that right now the proverbial media landscape is as bleak as hell. News budgets are still withering away and the goalposts keep shifting. Over the past year, I've had editors laid off and friends. My rates have been lowered. Entire networks have collapsed with whispers of worse to come. The lines between advertising and reporting are also getting blurry. Now as before, our only choice is to adapt and keep going. And it's reassuring to know that there are still champions of nonprofit journalism with an abiding commitment to the public interest and to the people who deliver it. On behalf of my fellow grantees, here now and out chasing stories, I want to congratulate the Pulitzer Center team for 10 years of bringing important stories to light. And thank you for being a fierce ally and advocate in these unpredictable times. I'll close by saying if half of what they say is true right now, we're going to be counting on your support a lot more. (laughs) And um, I'm going to ad-lib this. To all the um, foundations, patrons, sugar daddies, sugar mamas, (laughs) some of you here in this room, please keep it coming. We're going to need you. Thank you.